Well, thank you so much. Uh, and I want to start by thanking California Southern University for this opportunity to talk today. Uh, the issues surrounding uh, what has traditionally been defined as parental alienation uh, are extremely tragic family circumstances. And to the extent that this talk today might help lead to a resolution of those family tragedies, uh, it is much appreciated. Now, today I'm going to be talking about the theoretical underpinnings for a, a different approach to defining what parental alienation is than what has traditionally been uh, offered or described. And I have limited time today, only about an hour and a half or so, and then some questions period. So I'm going to limit my discussion today to just those theoretical underpinnings and the theoretical framework and structure for an attachment-based model to understanding what's traditionally been defined as parental alienation. Yeah, I'll be talking next week at a different seminar for about five hours where I will apply the model then to the diagnosis, to treatment, to the legal setting. Uh, I won't be able to get into those issues today, but if you're interested in more information along those lines, I suggest I have uh, my website. I have a lot of writings up on my website. I also have a blog that you can access, uh, and I recommend that. Uh, I've already got some what I believe are some interesting uh, posts up there, and I anticipate getting some more very intriguing posts uh, on my blog. So to start today uh, regarding an attachment-based model to parental alienation. It's not moving. Oh, maybe I need to turn it on. Yeah. OK, so I'm going to start by talking about the current or the previous structure uh, that was proposed for understanding parental alienation. The construct of parental alienation is essentially a child-initiated cutoff in the child's relationship with a normal range and affectionately available parent. Um, and it typically occurs as part of high-conflict divorce. Now, in the mid-1980s, a psychiatrist, Richard Gardner, proposed a model. He recognized a clinical phenomena having to do with with what he called parental alienation, and he proposed a model by which it could be identified. He referred to it as parental alienation syndrome, and he discussed a set of anecdotal clinical indicators by which it could be recognized, and he oft also went into describing how oftentimes in these situations uh, there are false allegations of child abuse uh, involved in this. His model, however, generated a great deal of controversy. Uh, first, because it moved beyond standard and accepted psychological principles, and he proposed this new syndrome uh, of clinical indicators that weren't really based in any standard or established psychological constructs or principles. And then secondly, by proposing that uh, parental alienation could often involve false allegations of child abuse, the whole dialogue and discussion went awry, away from parenting into child abuse allegations and those sorts of things. And so it's generated a lot of controversy, and uh, it's been about 30 years now, and it's still uh, semi-accepted uh, in, in the professional community. In my view, uh, Gardner's model of PAS, while he did identify a clinical phenomenon, it represents a failed paradigm. Uh, it's a failed Le uh, legal paradigm because it fails to produce the changes necessary to solve the family problems. Families have to litigate whether or not there's parental alienation. That can take years and hundreds of thousands of dollars in attorney's fees. And if families can't litigate, then it simply um, is unsolvable. It's a failed theoretical paradigm because he too quickly abandoned established psychological constructs and principles and the rigor necessary to define what the clinical phenomenon is within those principles. And so by doing that, he's constructed a model that's founded on sort of the shifting sands of anecdotal clinical indicators. And so when we try to leverage his model in the legal system or in the mental health system, the sands shift beneath our feet and the whole structure collapses. We're not able to leverage the model because it's not based in established psychological constructs. It's a failed diagnostic model because 
he, by going to anecdotal clinical indicators rather than established constructs, it's hard to determine whether or not parental alienation exists. There's a, according to the current or his model, there are degrees of parental alienation. So it can be mild or moderate, severe, which makes it very hard to prove within the legal system. And there's a lot of controversy within mental health as to whether it's alienation or whether it's really what's called estrangement, uh, which is a problematic construct in itself. And it's a failed uh, therapeutic paradigm because it does not tell us what to do about it. It's a new thing, parental alienation syndrome. It doesn't exist with any, within any established constructs. Whereas if we base our understanding within uh, standard, established, and accepted psychological principles and constructs, then those constructs lead us to what the therapy is. And so we can then understand the underlying foundations and uh, resolve the issues because we know what they are. So what I have done as I ran into this uh, tragic family cir circumstance, because my background is in you know, parent-child conflict. Okay? I deal with the angry, grumpy kids, kids throwing chairs through the walls, uh, ADHD kinds of family conflicts. That's what I deal with in an everyday sort of way. And so I recognize what authentic parent-child conflicts looks like. And in my private practice, when I ran into this parental alienation, I, uh, it's fairly easy to recognize inauthentic conflict that's being induced through family relationships. But when I tried to uh, address these issues, the controversy surrounding parental alienation syndrome undermined the solution. And so I set about over the last couple of years of redefining what the construct is from within standard and established principles. So an attachment-based reformulation uh, of parental alienation offers uh, the foundation, a theoretical foundation that's grounded on the bedrock of established and accepted and scientifically supported principles that we can then use to leverage the legal uh, interventions and to leverage the therapeutic interventions necessary to solve this issue. An attachment-based uh, model of parental alienation provides the theoretical framework that can bring mental health back together into speaking with a single voice as to what it is as opposed to this conflict, this conflict um, that currently occurs within the mental health field regarding whether parental alienation even exists, and if so, how to define it. So let me now turn to defining the theoretical foundations for this alternate paradigm to the Gardner's model. And this is the overall uh, structure of it that I will be explaining throughout the, the seminar here today. It starts with a disorganized, preoccupied attachment of the alienating parent that led the alienating parent to develop personality disorder uh, pathology centering around narcissistic borderline personality dynamics. Now don't get too hung up on the labels or the categories because increasingly personality disorders are being understood as having their roots in the attachment system and they're dimensional, they're not categorical. And so don't get too hung up on the actual labels um, more so, the labels are just sort of descriptive categories or descriptive shorthand to be able to talk about some of the features. Also, um, Kernberg, one of the leading figures in personality disorders, recognized that narcissistic and borderline personality dynamics are sort of flip sides of the same coin. Underneath, in the attachment system, they're the same dynamic, but they just have different outward manifestations for various reasons. So the disorganized, preoccupied attachment of the alienating parent during childhood constellated into personality disorder traits, uh, narcissistic and borderline. It also involves a, an attachment trauma, a relationship trauma embedded in the neurological networks of the narcissistic borderline parent. And that trauma is going to be reenacted in the parental alienation. The attachment system mediates both uh, bonding relationships and also the loss of those relationships. So when the divorce occurred, 
we have a reactivation of the alienating parents attachment system to mediate that loss experience. And so all of those trauma networks having to do with internal working models of attachment also get reactivated. And so it's this complex blend of personality disorder dynamics and attachment trauma that get, then get reenacted in the current family, family situation. So in organizing the theoretical foundations, there are three levels to an, uh, analysis of what's going on. And so it can seem complex at first, but if we kind of look at the different layers of things, we can get greater clarity on what's taking place. So at the surface level, there's a family systems dynamics. Okay, and so I'll talk about those in a second, of what the family system relationships look like. Underneath those and driving those family systems processes are the personality disorder dynamics. Underneath those, are the attachment uh, system problems and the attachment trauma. So starting with the family systems level. From a family systems theory, uh, families go through transitions. Uh, so the, for example, the, the birth of the first child creates a transition for the family. Uh, the growth of the child maturation into pre or to school years. Uh, or into adolescence where we ha now have an adult, a new adult in the family, or the launching of the child into adulthood. All of those periods involve transitions in the family. And if a family fails to make a successful transition, symptoms emerge. Well, the divorce and uh, dissolution of the marriage represents another transition in the family. And so, that's where this family, from a family systems perspective, is having difficulty. They're not transitioning in the family's transition, not successfully transitioning, to the loss of the marriage. And just because the marriage dissolves doesn't mean the family dissolves. Because once you have children, the family remains forever. Because what's happening is the family is transitioning from an intact family structure that's united by the marriage and because of the conflict or drifting apart of the spouses, the family transitions to a separated family structure that is now united by the children. Okay, so the marriage is dissolved, but the family hasn't. Now, in successful transitions, the parents are able to resolve their conflict and animosity and allow the child to serve their unifying function as you know, the parental roles of mother and father remain, even though the spousal roles have ended. In conflicted families, though, there's, when the parents cannot resolve their conflict, that provides this um, splitting energy or this con conflict energy that's dividing the family while the child is trying to serve their role uniting the family. And so the child can experience that inner conflict and we wind up with a whole bunch of symptoms in the child. In some cases, in pathological cases, there's a split uh, in the relationships, a cutoff in the family relationships, and so that the parental relationships mirror the cutoff in the spousal relationships. The person becomes an ex-husband as well as an ex-father, and that's what parental alienation involves. It's a cutoff in the family relationships as a means to manage the, the family conflict in the situation. So the reason for the difficulty, to drop a little bit down, in this. The reason for the difficulty in the family making the transition is because there's an underlying uh, narcissistic personality structure in one of the parents. The narcissist, there's two features about narcissism that are going to make it difficult for the family to transition. First, the narcissist is characterologically unable to experience sadness and grief. That's just not capable for them. The second is the splitting dynamic that occurs in uh, with both narcissistic and borderline personality dynamics. So in terms of the narcissist's inability to experience grief, Kernberg talks about that. They say, they, the narcissist, are especially def uh, deficient in the genuine feelings of sadness and mournful longing. Their incapacity for experiencing depressive reactions is a basic feature of their personalities. When abandoned or disappointed by other people, they may show what on the surface looks like depression, but which on further examination 
emerges as anger and uh, resentment loaded with revengeful wishes, rather than real sadness for the loss of the person whom they appreciated. So the narcissistic parent is unable to genuinely experience loss and sadness. And what happens is they uh, influence the child to interpret the child's own loss and sadness at the loss of the intact family structure in the same way the narcissistic parent is, as anger and resentment towards the other parent. And typically the narcissistic parent frames for the child, it's the other parent who's responsible for the divorce. Now we'd like for people to avoid that, but the narcissist doesn't do that. They engage the child and tell the child it's the other parent. Meanwhile, the targeted parent says, well, it's both of us, and they, they don't give the child a reason. And so the child adopts the belief system of the narcissistic parent, because they're not hearing any differently, that it's the other parent who was responsible for the divorce. And so and in that process, the narcissistic parent can, uh, influences the child to interpret the child's authentic grief and sadness as anger and resentment against the other parent. The second feature about the narcissistic borderline parent that inhibits the ability of the family to transition is the splitting dynamic. The splitting, um, to understand its core foundation, it's within the attachment system that is the origins of splitting. And what happens in the attachment system, in the attachment relationship, is the child experiences a parent who is simultaneously both nurturing, activating attachment bonding motivations, and frightening, activating avoidance motivations. So a frightening parent, the child seeks to flee from that parent and seek protection with the protective parent who happens to be the frightening parent. And so the child is caught in this conflict where the parent is simultaneously frightening and the source of nurturance. And so you have the simultaneous activation of these two bonding motivations. Various studies from Beck and all, Aaron Beck, various studies have found that patients with borderline personality disorder are characterized by disorganized attachment re representations. Such attachment uh, uh, representations appear to be typical for persons with unresolved childhood traumas, especially when parental figures in, were involved with direct frightening behavior by the parent. Disorganized attachment is to consider to result from an unresolvable situation for the child when the parent is at the same time the source of fright as well as a potential haven of safety. So what happens for these kids is that because they have both systems activated at the same time, attachment bonding motivations and avoidance motivations, they psychologically split those two motivating systems so that they're only one is on at any given time. At a neurological level, what's happening is you're getting, you're not actually splitting physically, you're getting an intensive inhibition, cross inhibition. So when the attachment bonding motivations are on, they entirely inhibit the avoidance motivations. When the avoidance motivations are on, they entirely inhibit the, the bonding motivations. So that for most of us, uh, we can have both systems on at the same time. We can you know, have bonding motivations on and avoidance motivations on and recognize that people are a blend of good and bad. Now, if I mostly think you're good, I'm going to get a little halo effect and I'm going to see a lot of good things about you, but I still recognize there's problems. Or if I don't like you, I'm going to see a lot of bad things about you, but I'm still going to recognize there's some good things about you because both systems can be on simultaneously. However, for the narcissistic borderline parent or the disorganized attachment, that's not possible. One system on or the other system on. That's what we see as splitting. So either you're idealized as all wonderful or you're demonized as all horrible. So what this, the implications for this in the divorce with a narcissistic borderline parent is that they are unable to maintain this ambiguity of relationships. So the ex-husband must become the ex-father. The ex-mother must become the ex, or the ex-wife must become the ex-mother. They cannot allow, they, they just can't experience that I don't like you as a spouse, but the child can like you as a parent. That's not capable for their neurological structure. Additional level of family systems um, understanding for this process has to do with 
triangulation of the child. A lot of literature on this, Mnuchin, Haley, Bowen, others, that when there's conflict in the family, some, or in the spousal relationship, sometimes the child is drawn into the spousal conflict. It's referred to as triangulation. There's two types of triangulation that can occur. The first is when the two parents unite against the child. In that case, the child is referred to as the identified patient, and the child's acting out behavior serves to bring the parents together uh, in a coalition against the child, and so can oftentimes save a troubled marriage. And so if, the, if it wasn't for the child acting out, the parents may split up, but the child serves to, to uh, maintain the marriage. The second type of coalition is referred to as a cross-generational coalition. This involves a parent-child coalition against the other parent, in which the one parent channels their anger at the other parent through the child, and so can covertly express their anger towards the other parent and the child. It's referred to as a cross-generational coalition. Uh, Jay Haley refers to it as a perverse triangle because it's crossing generational boundaries. The Haley defines what a cross-generational coalition is. The people responding to each other in the triangle um, are not peers, but they're from a different generation. One is from a different generation than the other two. Uh, in the process of uh, their interaction together, the person of one generation forms a coalition with the person of the other generation. So the parent forms a coalition with the child. By coalition is meant a process of joint action which is against the third person. The coalition between the two persons is denied. And so this idea of asking the child in parental alienation, is your parent influencing you? No, the child's gonna say no, the coalition is denied. We know that ahead of time, it's, it's, it's pointless to ask, is the other parent influencing you? It's gonna be denied. That is, um, there is a certain behavior which indicates a coalition which, when it is queried, will be not denied as a coalition. In essence, the perverse triangle is one in which the separation of generations is breached in a covert way. When this occurs as a repetitive pattern, the system will be pathological. Now, this coalition across generations is extraordinarily destructive. That uh, Kerrig, who talks about um, you know, the breakdown of the a parent-child relationship or the, the enmeshment of parent-children. The breakdown of appropriate generational boundaries between parents and children significantly increases the risk for emotional abuse. When parent-child boundaries are violated, the implications for developmental psych psychopathology are significant. Poor boundaries interfere with the child's capacity to progress through development, which, as Anna Freud suggested, is the defining feature of childhood psycho psychopathology. A theme that appears to be central to the conceptualization of boundary dissolution is the failure to acknowledge the psychological distinctiveness of the child. That is going to be particularly uh, vulnerability to narcissistic parents. Kerry goes on to talk about that. Rather than telling the child directly what to do or think, okay. Do it, we're gonna hold this on real good, sorry about that. Okay. okay, you're good to go. Okay, so rather than telling the child directly what to do or think, as does the behaviorally controlling the parent, the psychologically controlling parent uses indirect hints that respond with guilt induction or withdrawal of love if the child refuses to comply. So the, the narcissistic parent isn't just controlling the child's behavior, they're controlling the child psychologically. In short, an intrusive parent strives to manipulate the child's thoughts and feelings in such a way that the child's psyche will conform to the parent's wishes. In order to carve out an island of safety and uh, responsivity in an unpredictable, harsh, and depriving parent-child relationship, children of highly maladaptive parents may become precocious caregivers. Uh, who are uh, adept at reading the cues and meeting the needs of those around them. The ensuing preoccupied attachment with the parent interferes with the child's development of important ego functions, such as self-organization, affect regulation, emotional object constancy. So the child in parental alienation is actually taking care of the alienating parent. 
what appears to be an, a bond between the two of them is actually a manifestation of an insecure attachment, a preoccupied attachment, where the child is being engaged in a role reversal relationship of being used of what's called a regulatory object for the psychopathology of the alienating parent. So the bonded relationship is not a good thing. It's not really, look, it's not a healthy relationship. Although superficially, it looks like, oh, isn't everything wonderful? So let's drop down a level to the personality disorder uh, dynamics that are involved. And first off, there's an association between narcissistic and borderline personality. Uh, Kernberg talks about one subgroup of borderline patients, namely the narcissistic personalities, seem to have a defensive organization similar to borderline conditions, and yet many of them function on a much higher psychosocial level. The uh, defensive organization of these patients, the, the narcissist, is quite similar to that of borderline personality in general. What distinguishes many of the patients with narcissistic personalities from the usual borderline patient is their relatively good social functioning, their better impulse control, and the capacity for active consistent work in some areas that permits them to partially fulfill their ambitions of greatness and obtaining admirations from others. So there's an association, uh, underlying association between narcissistic and borderline processes. As we've come to understand the attachment system, we can understand that association much better at the lower level of the attachment system. In addition, uh, personality disorders go across categories. So Milan talks about several personality disorders co-vary with the narcissistic spectrum, uh, various personality disorders, as well as borderline. So we see those two show up a lot. And then Beck and all talk about how borderline personalities can uh, be associated with as many as five other different personality structures. So don't get too hung up on the categories just recognize that there's an underlying uh, narcissistic borderline personality structure. Now for the narcissist, uh, to talk about what their core dynamics are, Beck refers to it as schemas, um, Bowlby refers to them as internal working models. The failure to be superior or regarded as special activates underlying beliefs of inferiority, unimportance, or powerlessness and compensatory strategies of self-protection and self-defense. The core belief of the narcissistic personality is, uh, is of an in, uh, inferiority or unimportance. This belief is activated only under certain circumstances and thus may be observed mainly in res response to conditions of self-esteem threat. Otherwise, the manifest uh, belief is a compensatory attitude of superiority. So until the divorce takes place, these, people, these parents may appear fine, okay? Nobody recognizes a narcissist. They're, they're involved in the community, they're kind of grandiose, they present well, they're articulate, maybe even intelligent. It's when the vulnerability hits, the divorce, which is spot on to the inferiority. The, the parent is being rejected as a spouse. And oh, then you get the full display of their narcissistic borderline process. Milan talks about the decompensation of a narcissist. Under conditions of unrelieved adversity and failure, narcissists may decompensate into paranoid disorders. Owing to their excessive use of fantasy mechanisms, they are disposed to misinterpret events and to construct delusional beliefs. Unwilling to accept the constraints on their independence and unable to accept the viewpoints of others, Narcissists may isolate themselves from the corrective effects of shared thinking. Alone, they may ruminate and weave their beliefs into a network of fanciful and totally invalid suspicions. Among narcissists, delusions often form after a serious challenge or setback has upset their image of superiority and omnipotence. Can we say divorce? They tend to... Uh, exhibit compensatory grandiosity and jealousy delusions in which they reconstruct reality to match the image they are unable and unwilling to give up. Delusional systems may also develop as, uh, as a result of having felt betrayed and humiliated. Again, that's spot on to divorce. Here we may see the rapid unfolding of persecutory delusions and an arrogant grandiosity characterized by verbal attacks and bombast. 
So we're not just talking sort of normal range psychopathology here. There's an underlying delusional process that's occurring, and I'll talk about that more as we get into the attachment trauma that takes place. The borderline personality. The, so from Beck and all, the diagnosis of borderline was introduced in the 1930s to explain patients who are on the borderline between neurosis and psychosis. The patients with borderline personality are characteristic of by, uh, characterized by hypervigilance, um, feeling vulnerable in a dangerous world where nobody can be trusted and dichotomous thinking. And so you'll see that in parental alienation where the, the, the parent feels the other parent is abusive and, and they get this persecutory idea that there's a threat or a danger emanating from the other parent. Some traumatic experiences may have taken place at an early age, notably the kind of punishing, abandoning, and rejecting responses of the caregiver that led to a disorganized attachment. So as we drop to the attachment system level in a few minutes, one of the fundamental aspects of what's going on is what's called the transgenerational transmission of attachment trauma. That we have an attachment trauma in the alienating parent that is being manifested in the alienation dynamic. Uh, and so it's moving across the family and across generations. Another feature associated with a borderline personality is what's referred to as the invalidating environment. And so Marshall Linehan, one of the experts in borderline personality, defines the invalidating environment. A defining characteristic of the invalidating environment is the tendency of the family to respond erratically or inappropriately to private experience, and in particular, to be insensitive or unresponsive to private experience. Invalidating environments contribute to emotional dysregulation by failing to teach the child to label and modulate arousal, by failing to teach the child to tolerate stress, and by, here's the two important ones for parental alienation, failing to teach the child to trust his or her own emotional responses as valid interpretations of events, and instead, actively teaching the child to invalidate his or her own experiences by making it necessary for the child to scan the environment for cues about how to act and feel. There's an article I've, or an essay I've written up on my website having to do with a, a metaphor of the hostage for kids with parental alienation that describes how that occurs, the invalidation of the child's self-experience in the chaotic world of living with a borderline or the a uh, very hostile world of living with a narcissistic parent. Uh, Frusetti, Schenk, and Hoffman describe the profound effects that the invalidating environment can have on a child. In extremely invalidating environments, parents or caregivers do not teach children to discriminate effectively between what they feel and what the caregivers feel. What the child wants and what the caregiver wants or wants the child to want what the child thinks and what the caregiver thinks. Now within family systems literature, this was referred to as enmeshment. Um, with a borderline personality or narcissistic borderline, this is the invalidating environment in which the child's authentic experience is um, nullified. So the narcissistic borderline personality dynamics associated with parental alienation. This diagram sort of looks at that or explains that process. So at the top we have a disorganized attachment system with the alienating parent that produces the personality disorder dynamics, borderline narcissistic, uh, narcissistic primarily with borderline features. The divorce activates the, both of those personality dynamics and so we get an activated borderline and an activated narcissist who's decompensating into paranoid persecutory delusions. The invalidating environment off the borderline personality dynamics combines with the persecutory delusions that are coming from the narcissist to terminate the child's attachment bonding motivations towards the other parent. And I won't have time to get into how that quite works today. But in terms of the attachment system, the attachment system evolved because of the selective predation of children. So it's a predator-driven system. When a parent signals that there's a threat in the environment, the child seeks proximity to the protective parent. So if I have a narcissistic borderline parent signaling to the child that the other parent represents a threat to the child, 
the child's attachment system will be motivated to flee the threat and seek protective proximity to the parent. So that's essentially what's happening relative to the attachment system. In addition, the um, borderline uh, vulnerability having to do with abandonment fears and the narcissistic vulnerability having to do with in, just fundamental inadequacy are expelled onto the other parent. I'm not the inadequate parent, you are. I'm not the abandoned parent, you are. And so it, it's the child's rejection of the other parent serves to um, projectively displace the personality disorder dynamics onto the other parent. Let's drop down a level to the uh, um, attachment system level. The, at the attachment system level uh, involves the transgenerational transmission of relationship trauma from the attachment system of, of the child to the, uh, or the attachment system of the alienating parent to the current attachment system of the child. The child's attachment system in the current situation represents an inauthentic display of the attachment system. Now my background, I was doing ADHD, okay, that's my sort of my specialty area. And over the years I kept tracking younger and younger in the age group to see if we could, if we got it early enough, could we solve it, could we cure it? About the mid-90s, I dropped below the age of five, and when you do that, you have to come the other direction up from early childhood up. And so I developed a secondary background in early childhood mental health. And when you do that, you have to become familiar with all the different brain systems because they're opening up all over the place during early childhood. And so I have a background in both angry, grumpy kids and parent-child conflict, as well as early childhood attachment system kinds of stuff. So I swore I would never get involved in high-conflict divorce. It's too dangerous. That's why I chose ADHD. I went into private practice and ran, started to run into th some of these kids because it, there's a lot of family conflict. I immediately recognized this attachment system of the child's inauthentic. That's not the way the attachment system works. It's not an authentic brain I'm looking at. And so if you understand how the attachment system works, this is so easy to spot because it's not authentic. And I'll explain to you sort of the, the underlying structure of that. The attachment system, first identified by Bowlby back in the 60s and 70s, is a neurobiologically embedded primary motivational system. It's akin to the primary motivational systems for hunger and reproduction. It's a basic motivational system. And it was developed across millions of years of evolution having to do with the selective predation of children. And so predators are seeking the old, the weak, and the young. When they're coming through the grasses, they're not looking at the adults, they're looking at the kid. And so because of that, the attachment system strongly motivates children's bonding to parents. Okay, because children who didn't bond to parents were eaten by a predator. So, Barry Ainsworth, one of the leading figures in, um, in attachment literature and attachment research, defines the attachment system. I define an affectional bond as a relatively long enduring uh, tie in which the partner is important as a unique individual and is interchangeable with none other. Uh, in an affectional bond, there's a desire to maintain closeness to the partner. In older children and adults, that closeness may to some extent be sustained over time and distance and during absences, but nevertheless, there's an, at least an intermediate desire to reestablish proximity and interaction and pleasure, often joy upon reunion. Inexplicable separation tends to cause distress and permanent loss would cause grief. Now, a couple of things about this quote I wanna point out is first that it's um, it's to a unique individual, my mother, my father, interchangeable with none other. One of the things you'll see in parental alienation sometimes is the child will reject the mother and take on the stepmother as the new mother. Start calling the stepmother by uh, calling her mother and starting to call the biological mother by her first name or conversely the father and the stepfather. And so you will see this weird thing. Children don't do that. You can't replace people. Ooh, the narcissist can. Narcissists very shallow relationships. The people are interchangeable. So the idea that I've got the child who's 
interchanging people suggests I've got a narcissistic parent in there that's, that's influencing the child. The second thing I want to point out about this is that notice that uh, Mary Ainsworth talks about attachment system in older children and adults. People think the attachment system is just about early childhood. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. It's a primary motivational system throughout our lifespans. And you can think of it in terms of, of the language system as a metaphor. The language system, another regulatory system of the brain, develops in, in early childhood. Uh, we call it experience expectant and experience dependent. So the brain expects language. And so it's experience expectant, it's got brain networks already set up to acquire it. But what specific language it learns, Russian, German, French, is dependent upon what it hears. So it's experience expectant and experience dependent. Now we learn language in early childhood, you know, somewhere between two and six, we learn language. But we use language throughout our lifespan. Similarly for the attachment system, the grammar of the attachment system that we learn are called internal working models. We learn expectations for self and other in relationship, and we learn that grammar in early childhood. But we use that grammar throughout our lifetimes. So the attachment system mediates the spousal relationships, and it mediates our own relationship when we have children. So we use it throughout our lifespans. Mary Ainsworth goes on. An attachment is an affectional bond. And hence, the attachment figure is never wholly interchangeable or replaceable by another, even though there may be others to whom one is also attached. So if you ever see a kid calling a parent by the parent's first name, that's weird. That's not an authentic attachment system. Something's going on. In attachments, as in other affectional bonds, there is a need to maintain proximity, distress upon inexplicable separation, pleasure and joy upon reunion, and grief at loss. So now, if I have a child who's rejecting a parent, then I want to be going on visitations with that parent. Where is my joy upon reunion? Where'd it go? It's not real. I, I don't care. Parents are, can be grumpy parents. I'm sure we've all had kind of difficult parents and difficult childhoods. And yet we still maintain a bond to that parent. We still want that parent's love. Where's the grief at loss? The child is rejecting a relationship with a parent. The attachment system will respond with grief. That's just the way it works. Where's the grief? Children do not reject parents. Let me run that by you again. Children do not reject parents. Children who rejected parents were eaten by predators. Genes that allowed children to reject parents were selectively removed from the gene pool. Children do not reject parents. So the moment you see the child judging a parent and rejecting a parent, that's not an authentic attachment system. Who rejects parents? The other spouse. Husbands reject wives. Wives reject parents. So I've got parental influence going down to the child and suppressing the child's natural attachment bonding system because I've got a child rejecting a parent. Children do not reject parents. Now, I deal with angry, grumpy kids all the time. Okay, is it a parent-child conflict? Oh, absolutely. Okay, oh, big-time conflict. But it's still consistent with an authentic attachment system. In children, um, children are motivated to bond to parents. And when that bonding is interrupted or there's a barrier to that bonding, children experience grief and mourning. They experience sadness and loss. And that grief and mourning produces what's called protest behavior designed to elicit greater parental involvement to help regulate the child's you know, distress. And so authentic parent-child conflict is actually consistent with the attachment system. The child wants to bond to the parent. There's some sort of barrier that's preventing the child from bonding to the parent, which produces the protest behavior. There's your conflict. So what we do in psychotherapy is we figure out what the barrier is and remove it. And that's called therapy. What we do, what we see in parental alienation though, is a detachment behavior. The child actually wants to detach from the parent. That doesn't happen. There's a predator out in those grasses that is more than happy to eat the child. 
millions of years of evolution have selectively removed detachment behaviors from children's uh, nervous systems. Now, when don't kids have problematic parents and stuff? Yes, and you see characteristic displays. They're called insecure attachment, and it's insecure avoidant, insecure uh, ambivalent or disorganized attachment. But Bowlby talks about all of those distorted relationships are goal-directed adjustments. In other words, the child wants to form a relationship with a parent. The parenting behavior is somehow distorted, so the child distorts in an effort to get as much parental involvement as possible. So all of the conflict, all of the difficulty, is consistent with the child wanting to bond with the parent but being unable to. We do not see detachment behavior. It just doesn't happen. Children do not reject parents. They're eaten by predators if they do. Authentic parent-child conflict results from a barrier and it's designed to elicit greater parental involvement. Um, what happens in, in parental alienation is you will see a detachment behavior in which the child's trying to sever the bond, which is not authentic to the, uh, how the attachment system works. It's not an authentic brain. There are two characteristic features of the attachment system. The first is a possessive ownership to the relationship. My mother, my father, my husband, my wife, my son, my daughter, that person belongs to me and I belong to that person. Because if I run to any old adult in the, in the community, that adult may not protect me from the predator. I have to run to a specific person, my mother, to get protection. And I protect my son or my daughter. I don't protect any old kid. And so it's very, this quality of possessive ownership to the relationship. What happens in parental alienation? The child is rejecting a parent. That's my, that's my, that doesn't happen. That's still my mother. And oftentimes it will take on the step parent as my mom or my dad. That's not authentic to how the attachment system works. It doesn't happen. The second is the grief response that Mary Ainsworth referred to. When the attachment relationship is severed, there's a grief response. In parental alienation, where is the child's grief response? The child has separated from a parent. What happened to it? And that's a critical feature for understanding what's going on. The child has a grief response at the loss of the parent, initially at the loss of the intact family structure. The narcissistic parent distorted the child's grief response into anger and resentment against the other parent. And then the child rejects the other parent and has an additional compound now of a great grief response at the loss of the relationship with the parent. And the narcissistic parent distorts that. Your parent's bad. That other parent's parenting is bad. That's why you hurt. Because they're a bad parent. They're abusive. And every time the child goes on visitations with a targeted parent, they want to bond with them, but they don't. It hurts more. Ow. It's something about being with you hurts. I can't put my finger on it, but something hurts. And then when they go back to the alienating parent, they, there's no bonding motivation with the target parent because they're not available. So their pain goes down. I feel better when I'm with the alienating parent. It hurts more when I'm with the targeted parent. It must be something about you, the targeted parent, that is abusive. The, the narcissistic, you know, alienating parent's right. You're a bad parent. You hurt me. But it's not true. It's a misattribution of an authentic grief response that the child is having. If we just straighten that out again and help the child orient to what their authentic experience is, you know, you, it's, not, it's not because you hate the other parent. You actually love them very much and you want to bond with them. You want to get hugs. And if you get hugs and bond to that parent, all your pain is going to go away. That's the therapy for parental alienation in a nutshell. The child's symptoms in parental alienation are not authentic to how the attachment system, a neurobiologically primary uh, motivational system, works. It's not authentic. But that means anybody who's looking at this, the child custody evaluators, treating therapists, all those folks need to understand how the attachment system works. It is fundamental to professional competence working with this special population of children and families that professionals who work with this have to understand, have a, a pretty competent level of understanding for the attachment system. 
is dropped down into the alienating parent's attachment system. The, uh, the psychology of the alienating parent is kind of a scary place to go. And with the borderline processes, you have one whole set of things. With the attachment processes, you have a whole new level of understanding for the psychopathology that's emerging. I find this level the most fascinating. In going back to our diagram here, we have the triggering of the personality disorder, uh, and then that terminates the child's attachment bonding motivations. But a, an additional line coming through the pathology is this attachment trauma in the internal working models of the alienating parent's attachment system. The attachment system forms these internal working models of relationship expectations for self and other in relationship. These internal working models then coalesce during childhood and adolescence into the personality traits and features. The attachment system and its internal working models of relationship mediate uh, the responses both in terms of the formation and the loss of closely bonded emotional relationships. So, um, Bowlby talks about this, no variables, uh, it is held, have more far-reaching effects on personality development than have, a uh, uh, than have a children's experiences with his or her family. For starting during the first months of his relationships with his mother figure and extending through the years of childhood and adolescence in his relationships with both parents um, and others, uh, he builds up working models of how attachment figures are likely to behave towards him in any of a variety of situations. And on those models, are based all of his expectations and therefore all of his life plans for the rest of his life. Notice again, he's not talking about early childhood here. The attachment system is embedded into us and mediates our relationships throughout our lifespan. So what happens with the trauma relationships is um, the narcissistic and borderline personality processes are the coalesced product of the disorganized preoccupied attachment of the alienating parent. And the internal working models for the attachment figures in the alienating parents' traumatized attachment networks are in the pattern of victimized child, who was the alienating parent as a child, abusive parent, who's that uh, attachment avoidance motivation of the disorganized attachment, and so the frightening parent, that's the abusive parent internal working models, and then the nurturing protective parent, who is that split off attachment bonding motivations of the child that now are either cross inhibited, so one's either on or one's all off. And so in the internal working models of the alienating parent's attachment system, I've got two representational networks for the parent. The abusive parent and the nurturing protective parent. That's my splitting dynamic. So at the divorce, when there's a divorce, the narcissistic borderline parent's attachment system activates to mediate the loss experience. So now I have, in the brain, I have two sets of representational networks activating. One in the internal working models of the parent's attachment system, and the other for the current people. And look, my goodness, there's an actual one-to-one -one correspondence there, which, what, uh, which is what happens. The co-activation within the attachment system of two sets of representational networks one for the persons uh, in the current family relationship and one set embedded in the internal working models creates a psychological fusion of these two networks. And so there's a, an equivalency between the internal working models and the current people. And so you know, if you think about the brain, I've got the internal working models activating and I've got the current people activating at the same time. Well, they mean the same thing. These are the, and so there's a loss of differentiation. And so the activation of the two become equivalent to each other. I have the victimized child, the abusive targeted parent, and the protective alienating parent. This is critical to understand how this uh, induction of the alienation occurs. People right now think that the alienating parent bad mouths the other parent and don't say bad things about the other parent. That's not how it occurs. What the alienating parent does is gets the child to adopt a victimized role. 
And the alienated parent isn't doing this out of badness. They actually think this stuff. Remember Milan talking about the delusional disorder? They actually believe the other parent is abusive because they're activating to their trauma networks. That's the delusional process. The delusional process isn't just that the other parent's abusive when they're not. It's the, it's the activation of childhood relationship patterns that are being reenacted in current relationships. That's the psychosis. Borderline. Difference between neurotic and psychotic. We have an underlying psychotic process of a reactivation of trauma networks and, and, and uh, reenactment narrative. And by getting the child to adopt a victimized child stance relative to the other parent, the, that automatically defines the targeted parent as abusive. And the moment you define the targeted parent as abusive, then the alienating parent can become the protective parent. So this whole reenactment trauma or this reenactment narrative centers on getting the child to be the victim. The moment the child accepts the victim, everything else falls into place. And so this is automatically the abusive parent and I now become the protective parent. And by becoming the protective parent, the narcissistic borderline parent is able to manage their anxiety around this trauma because they've had this traumatized network about the abusive parent and their own and so now it gets activated again they're anxious they're really anxious plus the anxiety off of the you know borderline fear of abandonment and the narcissistic uh, inadequacy and so they're just an, a ball of anxiety but by displacing the abandonment fears and the inadequacy onto the apparent, other parent they're able to reduce their anxiety but they're still left with this trauma anxiety uh, out of the attachment system but by making the other parent the abusive parent so that I become the protective parent of the child, the internal working model of the child and the current child, I can now manage my anxiety. The child has a protector from the abusive parent. It's a script from long ago that's just being reenacted. But then they put the child out there as the abusive child. And therapists and everybody go, oh wow, we're so concerned about abuse. Maybe the other parent is abused. And we focus on the targeted parent looking at whether or not they're abusive, and the focus goes off the pathological parent. And the child is bonded to the pathological, oh, you're my wonderful parent. No, no, they're the best parent in the world. Because the child is serving as a narcissistic object for the parent. <laughs> I need to be the wonderful parent, so that child sees me as a wonderful parent, and so I'm using the child as a narcissistic object. It's not an authentic relationship, but it looks close, it looks bonded. And so people just totally miss it. They think that child actually is bonded to the supposedly favored parent and that the other parent, there must be something wrong. Why is, would the child reject the parent? That's not how the attachment system works. And do, does, does the other parent influence you? No, not at all, because it's denied. So what's happening, the features of this, is that rather than responding to the actual people in the current family relationships, the narcissistic borderline parent is responding to or re and reenacting past childhood relationship trauma. So here we have, as uh, understanding uh, what is occurring with parental alienation, we have three different levels to understanding this. At the core level is the attachment system that creates the personality disorders, but also the trauma networks that are being reenacted. Then we have the level of the narcissistic borderline parent who's displacing their own inadequacy and abandonment fears onto the other parent and is distorting the child through the inability to process grief and the splitting dynamic. And then we get up to the top surface level of the family systems level where you have the family being unable to transition from an intact family structure to a separated family structure. So to put out or to sort of lay out the dynamics of parental alienation. The divorce activates the attachment system of the alienating parent to mediate the, ex the loss experience associated with the divorce. The activation of the attachment system activates the childhood trauma in the pattern of abusive parent, victimized child, protective parent. The activation of the attachment system activates the internal working models of attachment that have coalesced into the narcissistic and borderline personality traits. And so you have the, the, the loss experience activates the attachment system, in, which is, activates both the personality disorder traits 
and the attachment trauma that are embedded in the attachment system. The narcissistic a divorce creates a narcissistic injury that reactivates the narcissistic uh, personality or that activates the narcissistic personality experience of core self inadequacy. You're the inadequate spouse. Okay. And at the attachment system level, this is the internal working models of self in the relationship. You're inadequate. And the divorce activates the borderline personality, fear of abandonment which at the attachment system level is the expectation of other in relationship. And so boom, boom, you get the activation of the two personality disorder features. And then because of the stress, you get the decompensating narcissist into the persecutory delusions supported by the attachment trauma of the victimized child, abusive parent. And, and then you get the uh, invalidating environment coming off the borderline where the child's experience is nullified so that the child becomes a reflection of the narcissistic personality. I'm the wonderful parent. You're the wonderful parent. Um, and the activation of the abandonment fear and the narcissist uh, inadequacy. So the excessive anxiety that's activated for the alienating parent that's associated with uh, narcissistic inadequacy, um, the borderline fear of abandonment, as well as the attachment trauma uh, that's embedded in there, is misinterpreted or misattributed as representing an actual threat posed by the other parent. So the alienating parent authentically experiences an intense anxiety. That's, they're not making this up. They're not to be because they're a mean person. They actually feel an intense anxiety coming off all these networks, but they misattribute it as an authentic signal of the other parent representing a threat. Now, is it a threat to me because I'm a narcissist? No, I'm wonderful. There's no threat to me. What's the threat then? In the attachment system, the threat's to the child. This other parent represents a threat to the child. They're an abusive threat to the child. And they reconstruct reality to create that threat. Now, how does that actually occur with the kid? All they have to do with the kid, coming back from a visitation with the other parent, is get the kid to adopt the victim stance. How did things go with your parent? Oh, okay. Oh. The parent goes in, drops affect. They indicate to the kid, signal the kid, that's not the right answer. The kid says, well, it was kind of boring. Oh my goodness. They didn't provide things for you to do? Oh, they only get to see you so rarely. How come they don't take care of you better and do give you things to do? I can't believe them. They're so self-centered and so selfish. And so in that, the alienating parent overreacts to what are essentially normal range stuff. But they overreact and communicate to the kid that this is somehow abusive parenting that they're receiving. That they're not being treated special enough. That's the narcissist. You're not being treated so special. And they give the kid the themes to which the kid can then... The other parent is selfish. The other parent has anger management problems. Kid says, yeah, you know, dad told me to empty the dishwasher and got really upset with me when I didn't got really angry and then punished me. Normal range parent-child stuff. Oh, I can't believe that. He's having you do his work for him? Oh, I can't believe it. He has so little time with you. Why doesn't he just spend his good time with you? Why does he think you... Oh, he's so selfish. He has these anger management problems. Just like that with me and during our marriage. Now, on the surface, is the parent criticizing the other parent? No. They're being wonderful and understanding to the child who is criticizing the other parent. So they get to hide behind the child. And, so the, and the child believes that. The child comes to believe, I'm the one criticizing the other parent. My, this parent is just being wonderful and supportive of me. They're listening to me. So therapists and evaluators who ask the child, is, are, is the other parent criticizing the other? No. I'm the one criticizing. They take responsibility for it. But it's a distortion coming through. The narcissistic parent, one of the symptoms of narcissism, is exploitation. They're inducing the child's symptoms and then exploiting the child's symptoms. One of the great exploitations on this is because the child is symptomatic, they can effectively, the narcissistic parent, can effectively nullify the rights of the other parent for custody and visitation. And nullify court orders for because it's not me it's the child the child refused to get out of the car 
What am I supposed to do? Drag the child from the car? And so they hide behind the child's symptoms. Courts don't sanction children for defying court orders, and they won't sanction the alienating parent because how can you prove it's the alienating parent causing this to the child? The child is saying, I'm doing it. And so that's how this whole dynamic emerges. The alienating parent gets the child to adopt the victimization role. The moment the child adopts the victimization role, the other parent's automatically defined as abusive, which allows the, t the alienating parent to be the protected parent. So you have the trauma networks feeding into the delusional process, the persecutory delusions uh, off of this. The uh, internal working models of the alienating parents' attachment trauma networks uh, are in the pattern of all bad abusive parent, victimized child, and all good protective parent, and then through the distorting, invalidating environment communications uh, coming off the alienating parent, the, uh, this whole reenactment, the child is induced into adopting the victimized child role, which automatically defines the other parent as abusive, which automatically allows the new parent to become the protective parent. And that's an important feature, that protective parent role, because that's the role that's allowing this parent to manage their trauma anxiety. So you will see that prominently displayed by the narcissistic borderline parent. I'm the protective parent. Okay. The abusive will be carried by the child. It's the child who's accusing the other one of abusive. And occasionally the narcissistic borderline parent will toss in a little sign. I, they were just like that with me in my marriage. I know just how the child feels. So they'll offer a little support for the child for doing that. But really the core role is the protective parent. Interesting, a phrase you will often hear with the narcissistic borderline parent in this is, I just want what's best for the child. It sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Do you know what? We all want what's best for the child. And it has the implication, I want what's best for the child, as opposed to the other parent who's so selfish and just thinking of their own needs. And they just want to be with the child. When the child doesn't want to be with them, they won't let the child come spend all their time with me. How selfish of them. That's the underlying message that's being communicated by, I just want what's best for the child. And they're trying to present as the all wonderful parent. So if you get a parent coming in and presenting as all wonderful, be suspicious. The, sometimes I will use a detective metaphor for clinical psychologists. We come on a crime scene and we gather information, clinical data, and then try to figure out what took place. So if you look at that metaphor for a detective, imagine a detective going on a murder scene and finding a typewritten, unsigned note that says, my name's Bill Smith, I committed this murder. Would you go, well, the case solved. I've got a confession from Bill Smith. That'd be a pretty lousy detective. If you get a kid coming in saying, I hate my other parent, they're mean to me. It'd be a pretty lousy psychologist if you just go, oh, okay, I guess so. Okay, there's all sorts of complicated dynamics, role reversal relationships, cross-generational coalitions, reenactment trauma. We need to look much deeper into this. So the trauma, all of this stuff produces this victimized child abusive parent reenactment that then suppresses the child's attachment system. The child sees themselves as victims. The attachment system does not bond to the predator. It bonds to the protective parent. If the alienating parent defines the other parent as the threat, as the predator, it turns off the kid's attachment system. That's why we see the inauthentic attachment system. It's been turned off by defining that parent as the, the threat or the predator. And, uh, and what you see is a bonding or proximity seeking to the protective parent, the alienating parent. They do not want to leave that parent. Now again, if you understand anything about the attachment system, secure attachment, the child explores the world and then comes back to check in and then goes back out to explore the world, then comes back in to check in but they engage in normal range exploratory behavior because they're safe from predators. If we're looking at parental alienation, the child is not engaging in normal range exploratory behavior of forming an independent relationship with the other parent. They're seeking to maintain continual proximity to the quote unquote protective parent. That's an indication of insecure attachment. And yet people look at the relationship and say, oh, look how bonded they are, as if it's a sign of secure attachment. It's not. It's an insecure attachment. 
If you understand the attachment system, this stuff just jumps out at you. And the way the child is forming, because the child has an insecure attachment with a narcissistic borderline parent, the way to strengthen that attachment is by forming that coalition, that us versus them. So now I'm bonded to the parent because it's us versus the other parent is a way of managing that insecure attachment. So the child's induced symptomatic rejection of the other parent defines the targeted rejected parent as the inadequate or entirely abandoned parent. You're the bad parent. The narcissistic borderline parent psychologically expels through projective displacement onto the other parent the narcissistic fear of inadequacy and the borderline fear of, an, of abandonment. You're the uh, inadequate parent and person, not me. You're the abandoned parent or person, not me. I'm the ideal, all wonderful parent who will never be abandoned by the narcissistic object of the child. So the child is both serving to bolster the narcissistic defenses that have been challenged by the divorce, as well as expelling the anxiety regarding the fear of abandonment and inadequacy onto the other uh, parent. Kernberg talks about the narcissistic object. The need to control the idealized objects, to use them in attempts to manipulate and exploit the environment and to destroy potential enemies is linked with an inordinate pride in the possession of these perfect objects totally dedicated to the patient. Now he's talking about narcissistic personality disorders. I think that's spot on to alienation, what's happening that the, you know, the child is when the child surrenders to the narcissistic parent and to the belief systems of the nar the child is granted narcissistic indulgences. And the child is just seen as the, oh, you're the wonderful child because I'm the wonderful parent and aren't we wonderful? And we're just wonderful in this few say And so the, the idealized object, the parent idealizes, the narcissistic parent idealizes this wonderful idealized object of the child and uses them in attempts to manipulate and control the environment. I don't care what the custody order says, you're not getting custody. I get to possess the kid as a symbol of my victory over you. I'm the better parent. See, I've got the kid. And to destroy potential enemies, the other parent, you didn't appreciate me for my narcissistic wonderfulness. You deserve to suffer. <laughs> you deserve it. That's another feature of the narcissist. And, and it links the inordinate pride in the possession of the child. I have possession of the child dedicated, uh, who's totally dedicated to me, the parent. Uh, it's a very destructive relationship for the child. The issue of parental alienation is not one of child custody. It's one of child protection. And that's critical that we begin to understand. This isn't a child custody issue. This is a child protection issue. The child is being used in a role reversal relationship with a narcissistic parent to meet the needs of the narcissistic parent. That's very destructive to the healthy emotional development of the child. And so the, here's your full diagram. Here's the complete kind of process. Disorganized attachment activates the personality disorder, activates the trauma network, feeds into the persecutory delusions, and the decompensating, the narcissistic inadequacy and the fear of abandonment are expelled from the narcissistic borderline parent by being projectively displaced onto the other parent. So on the back of this are a set of references. If there's more uh, information you're interested about this, I've written some stuff on, the, on my website about this applying it to therapy uh, in terms of working with the grief response of the kid, looking at some of the legal implications. If there's one thing um, that I would uh, suggest as to our approach to an attachment-based model of parental alienation is to begin to recognize that these child and family processes are a special population of children and families that require specialized professional expertise, knowledge, and training to effectively diagnose and treat in attachment theory, in personality disorder dynamics, and in delusional processes. And so we need to, to improve our understanding of this in order to be able to effectively treat it. The other feature is it shows, or hopefully this shows, how if we ground the theory in established constructs, 
it leads to a much greater understanding than simply running around with PAS and Gardner's model and we just continually to argue about that. Let's stop arguing about it. Let's bring mental health together to recognize the psychopathology and then what do we do about it? And so with that, uh, I'll open myself up for questions from people. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Childress. I'll start with some from the uh, virtual audience, and, and I'll uh, apologize in advance for uh, uh, I, there's no chance I'm going to be able to get to all of them. We've had almost 100 questions come in from the virtual audience. So anyway, let me, uh, let me get started here. Uh, what sort of psychopathology is commonly found in children in which parental alienation occurs, and what tends to manifest immediately, and what might tend to emerge uh, later on in adulthood? The, I would use a metaphor of a ventriloquist puppet. The child has lost the authenticity and their self-authenticity. And that's going to have implications because it's a transgenerational transmission of attachment trauma, it's going to have implications for their future marital relationships and for their uh, future relationships with their own kids in which this trauma is being reenacted. I have a, a post up on my blog uh, one of the things that having to do with the source origin of the trauma, one of the things about my work, because I work kind of a brain guy, is there are files within the attachment system, sort of the internal working models or the schemas. And as I work with people, I'll ping those files and see what the ripple comes back and start reading what the source code is within those files of the attachment system. And what's distinctive is some of the source code in there, the role reversal relationship, the you know, using the child, the cutoff in the child's relationship, is characteristic of sexual abuse victimization. Interestingly, borderline personality disorders are also associated with sexual abuse victimization. I suspect, now, now I'm not saying that the kid in this current situation was sexually abused. I want to be very clear on that. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is there's a trauma, possibly a sexual abuse trauma, that entered the family a generation or two earlier and is rippling through the family. And so this, what we see now with alienation, is a uh, second or third generation iteration of sexual abuse trauma previously. And so in terms of the pathology that we will see, we will, con it's, it's, we will continue to see it ripple through the generations. A little less with each generation as it works its way through. But you will see the role reversal relationships with the, the current child when they grow up with their own kids. They'll use their kids in the role reversal relationship. There will be spousal difficulties. A lot of times because of the unprocessed grief down the road you'll see depressive reactions, um, uh, possible substance abuse. There's some in the literature about this uh, that we need to be doing more research about this sort of thing. At the current situation, and this is where I could go into the diagnosis of it, what you will see in the child symptom display is a characteristic set of five narcissistic slash borderline personality symptoms. What the child is exhibiting isn't oppositional defiant behavior. It's borderline grandiosity of judging the other parent, a sense of entitlement, a haughty and arrogant attitude, a loss of empathy, and the splitting dynamic. So we're actually, we've got a child who is developing a personality disorder as we watch. And so that's the pathology that's currently going. Plus the child has a delusional disorder about the targeted parent being a bad parent. So I've got delusional disorder, I've got attachment system disruptions, I've got uh, personality disorder dynamics, all from the pathogenic parenting of a border, narcissistic borderline parent. This is not child custody issues. This is child protection issues. I'll ask a couple more from the virtual audience before turning to the uh, in-person group. Uh, this question has come in um, articulated a number of different ways, but it's a, qu a commonly asked question. Uh, a, a learner notes that he found it very helpful that you tied uh, the, uh, the narcissistic and borderline features to the attachment model to explain the process. And many wonder, do you often see parental alienation in the absence of a narcissistic borderline parent? It depends how you define parental alienation. So I am defining it as part and parcel of narcissistic borderline personality. So no, I would not see an attachment-based model of parental alienation in, in the absence of narcissistic borderline personality. Now you may have something else, but it's not an attachment-based model of parental alienation. And in doing that, we can sort of cir begin to circumscribe what we're talking about. And so it's not everything under the sun, it's about this specific thing. Now what I have seen, because 
Personality disorders are dimensional. They can blend across because they're all embedded in the attachment networks and so they're not distinct categories. I have seen complex blends. I have seen narcissistic borderline primarily narcissist. Narcissistic borderline primarily not borderline. The primarily narcissists tend to be men. The primarily borderline tend to be women and they have a different kind of futuristic displays. The borderline display will have a stronger fear of abandonment process. The narcissistic display will have more of a grandiose narcissistic object. I'm the wonderful parent and revengeful quality. I've also seen narcissistic borderline antisocial. That was that combination is really nasty. It has a domestic violence quality to it where the child is being used as a retaliation against the other parent. I had the dad in that case say, I'm out to destroy the mom. I'm going to bankrupt her. He said that in an interview with me. It's like, wow. Okay. I've seen narcissistic borderline histrionic. The father was so fragile and oh, she, my the other mother treated me so badly. And you know, and so there's a histrionic quality to that. I've seen narcissistic borderline obsessive compulsive. That was with a parent who was very religiously oriented and was the, uh, again, the dad was very critical of the mom for being the, uh, for being sinful and leaving the divorce and leaving the relate. So he had this very kind of anal retentive, uh, obsessive compulsive quality along with the narcissist. And so there's going to be a complex blend of, uh, personality dynamics. Yeah. Okay. One more. What personality traits or other factors might make a child more or less susceptible to the narcissistic borderline parent and ultimately parental alienation? Well, the narcissistic borderline parent is extraordinarily good at what they're doing. They're extraordinarily pathological and that pathology can be induced on any old kid. Kids are designed to socially reference parents for meaning construction. That it, you know, because the child's brain is immature, the brain realizes that. It does not independently attribute meaning in, as a child. Because if I, as a child, attribute meaning to something, I could be totally wrong. I can fall off a cliff, get eaten by a tiger. I all sorts of bad things. So children are designed to socially reference parents. A lot of studies on that. The parent, the child's a confused, ambiguous situation. They look to their parent. What, what's this mean? And so a divorce and family dissolution, a highly ambiguous situation. Child's going to look to the parent. What's this mean? They look to the targeted parent and the targeted parent does what we tell them to do, which is essentially say, oh, it's not about you. And they give a vague answer. Don't triangulate the child in. The narcissistic parent says, it's about the other parent. This is what it means. They have a bad parent. And they give them an answer. So the child adopts the answer. Plus, if the child surrenders to the narcissistic borderline parent, they avoid the pathology of that parent. There's nothing as toxic as a narcissistic rage. Narcissistic anger combines anger and disgust. And it's very, it's very disturbing for a child to see anger and disgust. Borderline anger is just this intense, flaming anger that's very chaotic and it's just out of control. And so the child wants to avoid that parental anger. And so by surrendering to the parent, they then become the idealized object and they can, so it's a very powerful seductive process. Notice the word seductive. Again, that's that, in my view, the ripple, the source code out of uh, sexual abuse some generations before. There's a seduction of the child. Yeah. I'm uh, Damien Athope, and um, my question was to your addressing the evolutionary perspective, and the evolutionary perspective, as far as I understand, for child bonding was actually towards the mother and not towards both things. And in fact, evolutionary uh, perspective would also say monogamy has never been the common, only a current thing. And so evolutionary, there wasn't a guarantee of who the father was or the father being there or the father being a massive role in the child. In fact, I know that there's two uh, cultures in South Africa that are the oldest. One 15,000 years hasn't changed, one 10,000. The has people, they don't even consider a child to be of one family. In fact, the whole tribe raises the child and they've done that for 15,000 years. The sand people of South Africa, the sand Bushmen, they actually um, have a relationship where the parents come and go the father kind of stays, but the mother comes and goes depending on who can support enough food. And so I was also wondering, in, even in our uh, Western culture, 
is there a multicultural element to this? Because I guess here, father and mother, is there, how about if it's adoption? Because that wouldn't be the original birth parents. That would certainly, so would there be no attachment or, or is it, it would affect your attachments? Or I also was wondering, what if the, the parents were homosexual and it was two females or two males? Uh, so just, here's, here's how the attachment system functions. The brain is experience expectant and experience dependent. So there are experience expectant areas that are expecting a relationship with the mother figure, expecting a relationship with the father figure. Um, now is the father, now in addition to being experience expectant, the brain is experience dependent. So the brain expects language, but what language it learns, it learns through experience. And so uh, the attachment system expects the ch the, to have attachment bonds. There will be adults who care for me. A predisposition to male, a predisposition to female, because it learns a little bit better, attaches, if it has a, a, a bias towards those. But now, if it gets an experience of two mothers, gay, okay, fine. I, I learned German. I learned German with a, you know, Northern German P European accent. I learned, you know, you know, five different accents of Chinese, you know, so we can learn dialects, we can learn accents, we can learn from experience dependent. But underneath that is an experience expectant. And fundamental to the attachment system and understanding it is that it's a primary motivational system that promotes child bonding to parents. Okay, so how that's actually expressed in any given situation is going to be a unique and individual. Now, is there a difference between mother and father? Yes, in early childhood, but now, I don't have the research on this because we're still early in our process of understanding the attachment system, but from my understanding of child development and my experience, there's a stronger bonding that begins to open up for children to parents in the, what Freud would call the latency years, uh, you know, right around the Oedipal period, and all of a sudden the child goes, oh, there's dad out here too. And so there's a more of a predisposition for dads to become involved in little league soccer, you know, all those sorts of things. And then there's changes that take place in adolescence and all those. And so we need to look at a developmental line to things. We need to um, understand that things are not, uh, you know, hardwired into the child's brain, but to understand the underlying attachment system and how it functions. The other feature that I want to caution about is saying, oh, the child is bonded to the mother and the dad's not all that important, so a child who rejects a relationship with the dad isn't you know, a problem. No, that's a problem. Uh, and th that dads are is important. The father-daughter relationship is hugely important. Father-son relationship, hugely important. Um, and so just because we think of early childhood as being mostly the mom doesn't denigrate the roles of dads in lives. Now, uncles are important. You know, other extended family, yes, and we can, we can get a lot of that. Um, adoption, I think it's interesting that adopted kids oftentimes want to go back and find their birth parent. I think that's just a ripple of the experience expectant in them. <laughs> they know that this is my dad, this is my mom, this is who raised me. So the experience dependent says, I have a mom and dad. But a little bit of the ripple off of experience expectant says, I wonder who my bio mom was. You know, and just as a question about that. So it's complicated, yeah. Good afternoon um, or morning. My name is Bonnie Delgado, and I'm here with uh, Psychology 80, I forget. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Uh, a hypothetical situation, a young girl in a situation that you described, say at 14, um, leaves the, stays with the narcissistic parent and totally eliminates the other parent in her life but then in 10 years let's say she comes back but then eliminates the narcissistic parent in her life and first off is there a realization that happens or a growth in the personality that has actually seen what has happened um, and then also she may uh, display borderline personality problems and that would come from what you were saying, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, one thing of concern to me, borderline personalities produce borderline personalities, narcissists produce narcissists. So if we leave a child with a personality disordered parent, there's a high likelihood that, that th those symptoms are gonna come up with the child. Um, 
the, once you allow the cutoff, Bowen, as a family system therapist, talks about the emotional cutoff, and so that's sort of the construct I would be using. The cutoff in a family relationship is pathological. There's a problem. And so allowing any cutoff is problematic. In terms of therapy, I want to get rid of those. I want to restore family relationships. I've worked with one mother who had schizophrenia. That's okay. The children love them. Mom with schizophrenia. Stay on our medication and we adjust for it. And, and the child needs to bond with the parent. And so if I've got a child with a narcissistic or borderline parent, we want that bonding with that parent. We just want to adjust for the pathology of the parent. Uh, so that doesn't distort the child. And one of the influences that can adjust for that is the relationship with a healthy range parent. So I want to eliminate all cutoffs. I don't like cutoffs anywhere. The issue, once there is a cutoff with the targeted parent, one of the hurdles you will find to restoring the relationship is the child's grief response. Because the child grieves that parent. And it, in normal development, the parent ch dies and the child grieves. In parental alienation, the child grieves and so psychologically kills the parent in order to process and manage the grief response. And so if the child reopens that, they're going to have to reopen to all their sadness and grief. And it's just, you know, the parent's dead, I just assume they stay dead, you know, because then I don't have to deal with anything. So when you get parental alienation, there's a high likelihood it's going to be a lifelong thing. Now there is also a developmental curve uh, that I work with normal families, adolescence and you know, young adulthood, the child goes out into the world and there's a separation from the family. But typically, developmentally, around age 25 to 35, there's a you know, reunification um, and restoration of the relationship. So no matter how bad adolescent was, when the kid's 35, they're having barbecue with the mom and you know, everything's restored and they laugh about how, uh, what a troubled childhood they had. And so there is a, a rhythm to that return uh, after separation. And so that could possibly play a role in this. The other feature I've noticed sometimes is the narcissistic borderline parent is so over the top that the child recognizes the pathology. And when that happens, they just go, wow, that parent's really pathological and they escape that parent. Um, but oftentimes the, the, it's too insidious uh, and it's difficult to escape. Let's see if I can articulate this. Um, are the dynamics of attachment disorder, parental alienation, and your role in providing therapy or treatment, are those complicated when the parents, uh, when their marriage is still intact, when there's no in in intent to, to divorce? That can happen. Uh, and prior to the alienation, you'll see a, a lead up into that process. Now, going back to established constructs, um, attachment the, the family is essentially, from a family systems perspective, uh, the child is being tra uh, triangulated into the spousal conflict through a cross-generational coalition with one parent against the other parent. That's exceedingly common. Okay, that's no big deal. We see that all the time. And so from a parental alienation syndrome model, I would say that that's what that mild to moderate looks like. It's negative parental influence that we see all the time. Parents have influence on kids and we, we, it's problematic. It crosses a boundary line though when we have a narcissistic borderline parent who begins to really distort the kid. Now we're looking at severe pathology. And so that's where I would draw a dichotomous cutoff. And I would look at the symptom display of the child that I'm seeing a specific set of symptoms in the child as, as serving that cutoff. When it occurs in the family, then I'm looking at broadly family systems kind of stuff of a cross-generational coalition. And prior to the divorce, I don't yet have the full activation of the narcissistic inadequacy and the fear of abandonment because they're still in the family. That parent or that spouse is still a very problematic spouse and it may be headed for uh, divorce down the road. But yeah, it gets really complex. My name is Buki Atolagbe. I'm in um, psychological assessment. Mm -hmm. One doctor reaches office of um, class. And I want to thank you for such a volume, volume of information that you have given us this afternoon. And I'm wondering if there would be any influence of um, extended family the gentleman had mentioned the, the, the African culture, cultural influence. Mm -hmm. You know, in order to mend it, because it sounds like 
if something is not done, it's just going to be a cycle on and on and on and on. Nurses take children, nurses take grandchildren, nurses take great great grandchildren. Where do we stop? Should there be uh, a, a, an influence coming from the extended family where this a child does not see himself as the only that he's connected to somebody mm -hmm. that is just not me alone in this world. Is it, you know, I'm all, I'm, I'm all in all. Kind right. Of. And under the DSM-4, they had a diagnosis of a shared psychotic disorder, which is essentially a shared delusional disorder. And under the DSM-4, I would say the child merits a diagnosis of a shared delusional disorder, that they have a delusion with the, shared with the parent uh, regarding the, uh, what they believe these abusive parenting of the other parent that's essentially normal range. And one of the issues around a shared delusional disorder is the isolation of the family. It gets very closed in on itself. There's no extended networks out. You notice Milan's quote talks about they reject shared thinking and alone they ruminate and create these fanciful beliefs. So that, uh, that isolation quality enhances the pathology within the family. So any uh, embedding into social con uh, context is healthy. One of the things, neurobiologically again, is the brain evolved in the context of a tribe where you're known from birth to death and so over millions of years, the human brain expects those relationships. And what we understand now from Shore and others is that there's a mirror neurons and things. The brains actually go into a resonant state with each other. And so the social brain actually stabilizes my individual brain. And so when I work with ADHD, one of the problems with my kids with ADHD is they drop out of the social field and I've got an isolated brain that goes all over the place and has impulse control problems and it's all because they're not being regulated by the other brains. And so to the extent that we can get the child into a social network, then the other brains can help regulate and get rid of the pathology. Problem is the narcissistic parent pulls the child away. The other problem is the narcissistic parent will pull them into their own family of origin, which produce the narcissistic parent. Which is, and so I've got grandparents with pathology and they all support the pathology and now I've got a, a whole little enmeshed what uh, Bowen describes, I think, as an undifferentiated ego mass. Okay, so everybody's just like all over here. The other thing that Garner noted as one of his anecdotal symptoms is that the children of parental alienation reject a relationship not only with the targeted parent, but also with the family of the targeted parent. And I find that interesting. I haven't quite figured that one out. It may have something to do with the attachment system, but I've, I've seen it. They not only reject you, they reject the grandparents or the uncle that they used to have a relationship with. So there's an intentional isolation of the child. And so, yeah, we need to, to get them back out there. The other feature that I would extend off of that is, as therapists, we are extended family. In a tribal context, we're the tribal elders, okay? And so you have a problem, you bring in this tribal, and so we have an influence at least my perception as a family systems therapist, we have an influence on the child to help balance the child out and say, oh, no, your target parent, that's fine. They took your iPhone away. Well, you were being a little jerk. You know, the parents take away the iPhones. Don't, you know, it's not a big issue. It's not abusive. Okay. And they help balance the child out uh, regarding the distortions coming off the other parent. Great. I'll try to squeeze in two more. Okay. Good. Uh, we had a couple of questions come in regarding, uh, in your experience, what impact, if any, does birth order have on what we're talking about today? It has some. Um, the narcissistic borderline parent is trying to manage their pathology. They're not, and, and they actually believe what's going on, so they're not thinking uh, in sort of a, a ma malicious way about things. They're just responding. And so they will target the eldest child. So it's the eldest child that they will go for the rejection and alienation with. And the other two, or the other kids in the family, will be spared the alienation to start with. And so you'll see the eldest kid reject the parent and, the, and they'll still maintain a relationship with the other two. But gradually over time, once this child flips and, and is fully on board with the, the psychopathology, then these two will start to flip the other kids down the road. But at least initially, it's just the older kid and the two younger ones remain. And so that's one of, when I see cases or when I'm assessing cases along this line, is how far along is this alienation process? First, does the, the child 
have some doubt. Is there some ambivalence in the child? That's a good thing. When, or has the child flipped? And that is a delusional disorder. That's less good. And then how, where is the status of the younger kids in this flipping process? Gives me a sense of how long it's been. Okay, I've been uh, si hanging on to this one for last. Okay. Uh, a learner writes in, she's been treating a family of three for, uh, for more than a year. The parents announced an in intimate, uh, imminent divorce. The narcissistic favored parent speaks with, with, spoke with her in private about testifying in court regarding the poor parenting of the targeted problem parent and asks you to stop therapy with that parent. How, what would your approach be in that situation? No. The, um, I, need, I need permission from both parents to testify. And if I don't get permission, and both parents have to understand what my testimony might be. It has to be informed consent. And it has to be in the best interest of everybody. And, and, and so there's a lot of considerations to take into account as a treating therapist going into a court situation. Um, and so it's walking a minefield. The other walking the minefield is the idea of making custody recommendations as a the therapist. Uh, that's a dangerous minefield. You haven't evaluated somebody, you've been in a different role. And so uh, the, the therapist needs to be very careful about talking about where the child should go or what the child should do. The challenge with parental alienation, as I've said before, is I don't see it as a custody issue. I see it as a child protection issue. And in my practice, I've evolved somewhat on this over time after treating cases and trying to treat cases and stuff, is if I see a case of parental alienation, attachment-based parental alienation at this point, I would diagnose with the V code of child psychological abuse. I, I believe that the uh, role reversal relationship with a narcissistic borderline parent represents, meets the standard for child psychological abuse. If that's the case, I'm also a mandated reporter, I'm allowed to report child psychological abuse, I'm not mandated to report it, and, and so there, it opens up a whole new ball of wax. In addition, as I would be called to testify or something, that opens up another ball of, you know, ball of wax or can of worms regarding uh, testifying in terms of abuse kinds of things. And, uh, so it gets extraordinarily complicated. Um, my hope is that the therapist in this situation can just take a hands-off approach and say, nope, I'm the therapist and I'm working family and that's how it is. And uh, I work from a family systems perspective and so if the family fragments, one of the things I would think about is that transition from an intact family structure to a separated family structure. And I've found that explaining that to families and to children helps them understand that the family isn't disappearing. We're just transitioning. And so how do we make that transition in the most healthy way for everybody involved? The other feature to recognize, and this may be where I'll be going in the next five years or whatever, is with the alienating parent, they're not a bad human being. No one's a really a bad, we, they're a traumatized human being who comes off of their own trauma history in childhood that's created a personality disorder that's annoying and irritating, but that is troubling. And so as mental health professionals, there's a pull to help them as well. And in this situation with a narcissistic or borderline, there's a tremendous anxiety around the divorce and uh, I'm inadequate and, and I'm being abandoned and things, and that activates the pathology. So understanding that, I want to go in with that parent and rather just pathologizing, rejecting that, I want to go in and see what I can do about relaxing that anxiety, relaxing that trauma that they have inside to allow them to, to or to permit them to allow the transition of the family. Um, into, into a, a healthier kind of position. And so, uh, you know, that's where, you know, the, the parent I hear there saying, they go to the pathology of the cutoff. So, uh, you know, cutoff relationships, and you're no longer a spouse, and so now you have to be, you know, an ex-parent as well. Well, now they're saying, you were the therapist for all of us, and we need to cut off that relationship. And to address that pathology and say, no, 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 that's not healthy. And so let's see what we can do about maintaining this family even as it transitions to a new family structure. Okay. And so compensating for that. The other interesting thing I'll just add to that is borderline personality is known for splitting. Narcissist also has splitting. And one of the things 
that we recognize is uh, as supervisors, as, um, as a lot of times as clinical supervisors or as team approaches uh, in, in therapy, is the potential for the infection of the splitting to the supervisory staff. And so you get staff splitting. And so you get a borderline trait you know, uh, supervisee into a supervision group kind of situation, and one supervisor will be on the favor of the child, uh, favor of the you know intern, and the other will be hostile to the intern, and they'll start fighting amongst themselves. And so you get this parallel process in the supervisory staff to what's going on, to the splitting dynamic, and that's what I believe is occurring quite right now in mental health regarding parental alienation. We have a borderline process. And so the professional community is all arguing amongst ourselves. Oh, there's parental alienation. No, it's junk science. And, and we're fighting that splitting dynamic. And as therapists, we need to be cognizant enough to recognize that and not do that. No, 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 I'm not going to be split. I'm not going to do this stuff. We need to stay unified in our approach to the psychopathology and not demonize the psychopathology. Uh, we're treating it. And so to maintain that balanced approach, for the therapist would be my recommendation. Thank you. Well, unfortunately, we're uh, just about out of time. But before we go, a couple of quick items. And first and, and, and foremost, thank you so much, Dr. Tilden, for a thank fantastic you. lecture. This is wonderful. Thank you.